Justin. Yeah, man. So uh, let me ask you something. Do you ever have those moments where you get stuck? Where you like, you can't, you can't seem to like get things done and you're just kind of, you're just stuck. You know what I'm saying? You're like, you get into that spiral and you're just like, feel bad about yourself because you're not doing stuff. And then you don't do stuff because you're feeling bad about yourself. So on and so forth. You just described my everyday existence to a T. Yes, I <laughs> know that. But you know what? Uh, did you know that there's there's things that you can do, including uh, uh, you can get trained in, in to a certain degree, so you you can like overcome all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need you need you need. There's hope for me. There is hope for you, man. And I think I think the next guest, our next guest, will do that for you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Marketing Geeks. Marketing Geeks. Uh, all right. Our, uh, our next guest is uh, our next guest. Our guest is a uh, he is uh, uh, a speaker and uh, TEDx speaker, but he also has an academy called uh, the SuccessCore.com. That's C-O-R-P-S. As a silent, uh, and he could make things happen for you uh, in a in a very grand way. But you know what? I don't want let 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 him tell you all about it. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Sean Douglas. Woo! Welcome to the show, Sean. Awesome, man! I'm pumped to be on the show. Oh man, we're pumped that you're here. I can, to, for for our listeners who don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. I am a Air Force, U.S. Air Force veteran. I'm a TEDx speaker, business positioning strategist. I have a online radio show that's heard in 79 countries called Life Transformation Radio. And I'm an international best-selling author and founder of four companies. Wow. Wow. And, uh, and, and what, what, uh, I, I mean, give us a little bit more, like what, what, first of all, what are your companies? What do they do? So the, the, First two, I sold off so I could concentrate on the next two. And the Success Core Academy is my main focus. And then I started an affirmation and empowerment clothing line last year. Oh, wow. I like that idea. So I have an affirmation and empowerment clothing line that is called LYB Clothing Inc. means live your brand. That's what LYB stands for. It means live your brand, not Reeboks, not Nikes, not the NFL, not sports teams your brand, whatever your values are, whatever your beliefs are, you live it, breathe it, love it. And you put it on a shirt and, uh, and you get to wear it proudly. I love, I love that idea. Now you're, so you're ex military United States air force. You're, you're no longer, are you in any capacity involved in the military still, or are you out yes. all the way? You are. Yes. So, okay. So what, what's your current role there? And, and also thank you for your service. We do want to acknowledge that too. Thank you. Um, I am still enlisted until September of 2021 when I officially retire at 20 years. Wow. So I've built four businesses while simultaneously serving on active duty military status. That That's amazing. Do you, do you, uh, and, and what, what, what role do you have in the military? What do you do? Uh, so right now I am a support non-commissioned officer in charge, which means that the, Aircraft that have to fly, um, I make sure they have all the support equipment that they need and make sure that behind the scenes that we have the tools and equipment for them to do the job on a flight line. Okay. So uh, first question I have for you, UFOs. <laughs> what can you tell us? I can't. <laughs> oh, can, neither, can neither confirm nor deny the existence <laughs> which, which if they didn't exist then i would just tell you no well i uh my, you know my answer to that is uh why why would a super advanced uh alien species even need ufos if i mean you get to a certain point where you're that advanced why would you even need a spaceship uh, you know. Because everybody has a vehicle to get around somehow. <laughs> ah, ah! So you do know something. <laughs> so, um, so tell me, tell me a little bit about the Success Corps and how that came about. Well, I noticed that a lot of veterans were getting out of the military with no plan, no purpose, and they thought that life on the outside as a retired veteran was going to be so glamorous, but it's not. And you start to get bored, and you start to 
go down a road that leads to suicide, depression, and everything else. Yeah. Now you, you had you you had your own experience. With I this, did. Right. I had my own experience. Do you been talking about that? Yeah. Um, I joined the military for for some of the wrong reasons, some of the right reasons. I joined the military mostly because my dad, who left when I was in kindergarten to join the military, I joined the military because he was in the military, which is not a great reason, but is a great reason. Did you join right at 18 or when did you join? I joined at 18 on 9-12, September oh, wow. 12, 2001. <laughs> wow. So I was- so you, you were one of those guys that were like, I, I got to do something and you you- I wasn't listen. going anywhere. Like I was, I was working a discount tire as a warehouse manager. You know, I was throwing tires and inventorying tires all day. You know, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what I did. But at 18, I was a manager. So I was like, Oh yeah, this is awesome. The problem was that I, I graduated high school with a 1.9, 2.0. So I was not going to college and we were broke. Like we, like my mom was busy paying for my older sister's college. There's no way she's going to pay for my college. And I didn't even get enough good. I didn't get enough great, good enough grades to even get into community college. It was pathetic. <laughs> so you kind of have to show up to high school in order to get good grades. The problem was that I would show up for my tests, ace my tests and never do any homework. So they were like, dude, you'd be an A student. I'm like, I don't want to be an A student. Like, I just want to do my own thing. You know, I was building cars and racing cars and work with my uncle. And like, I would go work at farms and I would just go do, do odd jobs. And like, I didn't really have a purpose in life. And so I joined the military on 9-12 because of everything that was going on in 9-11. But then the first thing I did was I called my dad. I was like, are you proud of me now? And he goes, well, we'll see how you do in the military. Oh, wow. So that's the kind of dad I grew up with. Like he has his, uh, he literally told my mom when I was in high school that, well, I got my own family now because he remarried and had a family he had a couple of kids. Oh and he, man. And he's like, Hey man, you know, I got my own family to worry about. So he wasn't really doing anything with us anymore. It was all about them kids and raising those kids, you know? So that's kind of, that's how I grew up. That's literally so, how I grew up. So how many, uh, how many deployments do you have then? Like how many, how many, six deployments to, to where to both Afghanistan and Iraq and where else? So in 2003, I was deployed to Kirkuk, Iraq. Okay. I was deployed to Qatar. I've been deployed to Afghanistan twice, both to Bagram Airfield. And I've been to, deployed to two undisclosed locations in the Middle East. So what about, like, have you had to deal with um, anything with related to post-traumatic stress? Everybody like, does. A few of the people that I know, we're, we're the same age because I was also 18 I was also 18 when 9-11 happened, um, although I, I was in college and uh, did not want to join the military. But uh, I'm, I'm just thinking, like, the people that I knew that went over there, like, they came back, like, really fucked up and, um, like, mm -hmm. mentally. And they saw some crazy things. Like, yep. and I know that one of the things that you teach through your academy is resiliency training. Um, can, yes. can you talk, like, where, where that does that cross with, like, PTSD? And, and I realize it also yes. crosses with, like, addictions and things like that, I would imagine. Yeah, talk a little yes. bit about, like, how resilience training fits into all this. Yes. Everybody has PTSD. Yeah. Everybody in the world does. Everybody. To a certain extent. I think, I think people in the military nope. have it worse. Nope. No? Everybody does. Okay. Well, no. But everybody does. Everybody does. Everybody has PTSD. Everybody. If you see a woman get hit on the street, does it not trigger you? Or do you say, ah, oh, that's okay. Yeah, it would, it would trigger me. So, I mean, it would trigger you, right? Yeah. So, so technically you have it, you have a moment in your life where, where somehow, whether it be abortion, domestic violence, drugs, alcohol, uh, bullying, you name anything, car accidents, anything. You have a traumatic moment in your life. Everybody has one. Everybody has some form of PTSD. Everybody does. So when, when a woman goes into a relationship after a domestic violence relationship, she's very standoffish. She's not giving too easily like she did in the other relationship. It's PTSD. Yeah. Somebody who battles drug abuse and, and alcohol abuse, and what I talk about in resilience, is that they have a traumatic moment whether they were found unconscious or they had gotten a bar fight or something like that, that was a traumatic. Everybody goes through a traumatic moment. Everybody has one. Everybody. If you're in a car accident, traumatic moment and you remember it and people get too close to you on the freeway, you start to get triggered. You start to freak out. Everybody, everybody has PTSD. So let's stay there. Resilience is your ability to withstand, recover and grow through adversity, stress, 
and life's changing demands. In order for you to get away from PTSD, you must have a PTSG mentality. It means post-traumatic growth. Why does that, like balloons, if I hear a balloon pop and I'm not aware, I'm on the ceiling. I'm like a cat. I'm on the ceiling. Because those pops represent gunfire in my mind and the pops represent bombs going off. I was in church and we were walking around. They had some kind of a bonanza, Christmas, whatever. When this lady got a sale, she popped a balloon. And I heard popping. I was like, oh my gosh, you're not supposed to carry in church, but I carried anyway. So here I am gripping my side and my wife's like, you're fine. You're okay. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm okay. Well, we were standing right there and my back was turned to it. And I literally in seconds, when I heard the pop immediately grabbed from my side, my wife stopped me. I almost drew on that lady. Wow. Like it, like it's a real, like I heard the pop and I immediately whipped around and in the middle of whipping around, my hand went down and I grabbed it from my holster and she hugged me so that I couldn't go further. She's like, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. I'm like, okay. Is there anything that you can do to desensitize yourself from those kind of like stimulus reactions? Like when you hear a pop, is there any kind of work that you could do with that? Or do you have to just kind of adapt and know? You just, you adapt. just adapt. You okay. just adapt. I know a guy. I know a guy. You know how crazy this is? This was crazy to me. Like I can watch fireworks. I can't listen to fireworks. I can watch them. My friend can't watch fireworks. He has to watch them through a phone. So he's at a 4th of July thing, or if there's like a baseball game or something that they know is going to have fireworks, he takes out his phone and he videotapes them. He's at the firework display, but he's watching the fireworks in the sky through his phone. He's calm as hell. You take the phone away, he freaks out. Wild. So so how how did you, was this at the point, I want to go back a little bit and, and talk about the origins of uh, the success core. Yep. Uh, what what was your journey like when you realized you know that you you needed to get out of a, a the spiral that your PTSD was overwhelming you? Well, that's the thing. So my PTSD wasn't overwhelming me at, in a way that I mean, some guys suffer crazy, like they have sleep apnea, they wake up in cold sweats, they're freaking out on the freeway. I mean, these guys really suffer. I mean. Really? In 2008 uh, was my worst year. I was gone 220 some odd days on and off. I was in and out of, of AORs, which is uh, area of responsibility. I was I'd in and out of AORs. I was gone for a month to Afghanistan. I'm home for three days. I'm gone again for a week. I'm home for a week. I'm gone for a month. I'm home for three months. I'm gone for a week. I mean, it was just in and out, in and out. And I was gone, you know, 220 some odd days. I got off of one plane, was handed orders and onto another plane, like weapon and everything. My wife was there at the airport to pick me up, you know, and I had to call her and go, sorry, I'm on another airplane. She's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'm gone for another couple of weeks. I mean, it's just, that was just the name of the job. I was in a combat unit. I was on a combat logistics unit and, uh, and we were just on the road. You know, we went and sh we, so what I did was I recovered, um, downed airplanes, like whatever was left of it. Wow. So what, what inspired you throughout all this to, to kind of like, where did business come into this? Like when, when did you decide, like, um, I, yeah. like as you're, you know, in the military, you're getting, you know, you're heavily involved in all this. Like what, when did like mm -hmm. the entrepreneurship vibe come into you into play here? Well, my uncle had a business my whole life. My, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. He used to flip, flip, um, Mustangs and Corvettes and like hot rods. Okay. So I come from both my mom and dad's side come from a hot rod family. And uh, my uncle used to, you know, build them and work on them, whatever. My, my grandfather used to flip them. You know, he would put some money into them, make them run better, whatever he had to do and, you know, flip them. Um, my mom, when I was a sophomore in high school, started, started her company, which is a home healthcare business. She's been in the nursing field for 30 some odd years. Mm -hmm. So I was introduced to entrepreneurship, but didn't really get it. I was always the one that would work hard for money and figure out how to make more at the same job. Like, do I get a raise or, you know, so I'm in the military, I'm in, I'm in England and I'm watching the, and I, my mind's always worked, um, forward thinking, but I'm in England, my first duty station, I'm in England and I'm watching these foam parties and these glow sticks and these raves. And I'm like, this is nuts. <laughs> this is crazy. Like, this is awesome. Fire breathers. I mean, this, I mean, some in European parties get nuts. And I was like, I was like, oh, well, yeah. how can we, how can we make this different? Like, how can we improve this? So I, I got a job at a club 
And then I was DJing for a little bit and then I was putting on the events and then, and it just stemmed from there. I'm like, this is amazing. I want to do this on my own. And so I learned everything I could about that DJ business. And from 04 to 08, I owned Fresh Entertainment, which my last name was Douglas. Everybody called me Dougie or Dougie Fresh. And so it just stuck Dougie Fresh, Fresh Entertainment. And we had four DJs and it had a videographer and a photographer. So there was uh, about five or six of us working on and off. You know, we have five guys or four guys or six guys on and off on projects, producing conferences, summits, events, never did a bar mitzvah. We do weddings. We do quinceaneras. We do high school dances. We do bars, clubs, you know. And how were you finding your clients at the time? And that's everywhere. I'd call up, I call up, uh, uh, like two or three bars every day. Like, do you have a DJ? Do you want a DJ? Do you, do you have an event coming up? Can we host an event? Can we host an event at your, at your venue? You know? And I just literally called up every bar within a hundred miles hmm. every day. I'd call up bars in a hundred miles and go, we'd like to put on a party for you guys. We'd like to put on this. Can we do your Super Bowl party? Can we do this? Can we do this? And we come up with parties, you know, we like your one year anniversary party. Can we do a two year anniversary party? Can we, like, can we do, and we just try to do that. And so just hustling. Yep. And that's it. I just called everybody. And then by 2008, we're booked. So not only am I gone and, and I'm running a business in the middle of a desert, but I'd come back, get completely obliterated with alcohol and, and then try to operate a business, try to operate my life. My wife left. Uh, she's like, I can't even do this anymore. This is ridiculous. And then, in, you know, December, 2008, I put a gun in my mouth and I tried to kill myself. It Whoa. just, it just got too much. I couldn't, I couldn't, the lifestyle that I was living, I wanted to live a rock star lifestyle. I wanted to get random women in a, in a nasty bathroom in somewhere down the road bar. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I wanted to have like penthouse suites with like four women in bed. Like that was my idea of a rock star lifestyle, you know, military guys walking into bars, getting whatever woman they wanted, you know, at the bar, like doing it at the bar which was amazing. But I'm just saying like this was what I was living and nothing was fulfilling. Nothing. The more I did it, the more I felt unfulfilled. Well, two, two points. First, I just want to, I just want, before I, before I address that, I just want to say, it's funny how people listen to like all the like marketing podcasts like ours and all these, and they're looking for like these secrets on how to build a business. But like you just said, you picked up the phone and cold called to build this business to begin with, which I just want to make that point. Yeah. Now, um, separate than that though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you, you wanted to, you took this, you kind of uh, had this industry because you wanted to live the rock star life. And, and I get that. And, and so you pursued, you pursued this, which so what, uh, like, what was the moment that, I mean, obviously we, we know the, the, like, the moment where, <laughs> you know, everything was on the line here, but like, what yeah. went through your head exactly? Like, how did you come out of it? Like, how did you survive? Like, what, what was the saving grace that let you continue to live? Well, you know how they say that, you know, it takes 90 days to work off the weight, but it takes like four years to get unhealthy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much what happened. This is pretty much what happened. A little bit of drink, a little bit of drink, more of a drink, more of a drink, one woman, five women, you know, I think it was just like over and over and over again. My wife now knew me back then. She goes, there's no, like, I'm never going to get with you. You're a sleaze bag. You only use women. I'm like, you're damn right. So it was like, I just, I, I didn't love myself was the problem. Mm -hmm. And the moment that I knew it was because I showed up on duty drunk. I got charged with an article 112, which is against the UCMJ uniform code of military justice. I was charged with an article 112 drunk on duty. And uh, I was set to be court-martialed and all that stuff. And they were going to kick me out. And, but they, they, they wanted to try to save my career. Like, man, you do such great work when you're downrange because it's a dry, it, it's, you can't drink. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so they were like, man, you do so good when we come home. You're just, dude, you cut loose way too hard. Like I go hard, hard. And I don't stop till I pass out. And I just, I don't know when to stop. So they were like, you have a problem. You're an, you're an addict. You know, I don't think I was an addict to alcohol or partying. I think I was an addict to the way it wanted that I thought it would make me feel. Yeah. You know, when you feel good, you'd be like, I'm a, like, somebody could say I'm an addict to love. I must be loved. I just took it way too far. And the moment that I knew was when I got charged and then they worked with me, worked with me. And then I started doing more stupid stuff. And then the moment was my wife's gone. I'm like, that's it. I'm a mess up. Like, I, I can't, I can't keep living this life. And then that's when I decided like that whole suicide moment. Well, people started calling me. They were like, I haven't heard from you in like three days. This is unlike you, you know, and I was completely wasted. Jack Daniels in one hand, a gun in the other. And, 
and they stopped me. They, they came and they stopped me. And, uh, I actually had to live with my supervisor for like three weeks and he took away all the weapons. I was on suicide watch for three weeks. So they got me to the chapel and they got me some therapy. And then it come to find out that most of what I endured, cause I came from, from the time I was in second grade to the time I was in seventh grade, I was physically, mentally, and emotionally abused by my stepfather. Mm -hmm. But me, me and my older sister, she was sexually abused. I was just punched and beat up a lot. And, uh, and, and it stemmed into my adulthood when I would drink and I'd see people be mean to each other and I'd flip out and fight people. And it was just, I was, I was an ugly, ugly drunk. And, uh, and, and there was a lot that I needed to do. So therapy helped the chaplains on base helped. I was so against God. I hated God. I was raised Roman Catholic. I thought it was all his fault. Uh, because you know, if, if, if you're supposed to be for me, then why, why is my life in shambles? Like why? Mm -hmm. So I blamed him for everything. And I never wanted to take accountability. It is never my fault. My friends left me because they suck. I'm the awesome drunk. They're they They suck. You know, my, so I got bought out of my business. They kicked me out. Um, I stayed in the military, got help. And then that was the turning point was me actually admitting that, you know, I don't love myself. Let me, I'm, I'm just curious, um, when you, when you were getting help with all this and, and kind of working through it, now, did you, in your, in your experience, did you have to, um, did you ever take like antidepressants or any medications nope. involved? And what I just want nope. to know, like, do, what's your take on like antidepressants? Do you think they're necessary or in your opinion, um, can people get better without them? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All encompassing. I, I, I had to, I, I had to take an, antidepressants. Yeah, I had I, I had to take antidepressants and and uh, but I also did a lot of mushrooms and, and I think that helped too. So you know they have uh, they have uh, they have that uh, what's that DTP or whatever that is now. You know people are having like these far out trips and they're going to Burning Man D and DMT. That that's DMT, me. Yeah, 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 DMT. Yeah, Lots man. Of DMT went to Burning Man, drank yep. ayahuasca the whole the whole. Yeah, man. All oh, the ayahuasca. I can't wait to get out of the military and try that. That's the oh man, doing. it's wait, 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 wait. Do that regard. I just want to bring this up because it's an interesting point. Um, I mean, you you read you'll read about these stories where where um, there are people with PTSD that are now being experimentally treated with drugs like ecstasy and yep. psilocybin mushrooms, LSD. Um, yeah, LSD. Yep. Uh, do you, like, what's your opinion on that kind of stuff? Do you think that is is helpful? I mean, do you, do you know or do you have an opinion on that? I, oh man, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Oh my god, I think myself. This is not an opinion of anybody that I'm associated with. This is only Sean Douglas Incorporated, and this is <laughs> my. I mean, literally, I like. I would never do anything to jeopardize my military career, drugs, any of that stuff. Yeah, I think, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I think that LSD. Mushrooms, ayahuasca, anything that alters your mind or your body in such a way that you have an enlightening of yourself and the government restricts it is good for you. That's what I think. Yeah, man. I mean, it's if you if you want to tell what's up with the society, uh, any society, just look at the drugs that they sanction and the drugs that they find taboo. Hundred percent. In our in, 100%. in in our in our society, in the Western society, it's like uh, small bits of uh, like Adderall and Ritalin just to keep you going and focused. Uh, alcohol to get you a little detached. Caffeine to yep. stimulate you. But anything yep. that expands your mind, man. Uh, well, you know, that that's uh, that's a, a big no-no. I, I always found it crazy that alcohol is legal, considering it's one of the most dangerous like drugs out there. And it's one of the few that I can actually kill you from withdrawal. And, one of the few. And the most yeah. addicting. Yes. And the most the most addicting. It is is literally the most addicting. So I have a theory about this. Um, I don't think I, I, I'm not even I'm not even joking. I don't care what science thinks. I personally do not think that people are addicted to alcohol because of the chemical. I, I don't think that at all. What I think people are addicted to is the way it thinks that they make them feel. Yes. Interesting. I don't want to sit here and drink a beer right now. That's not what I want to do. But if somebody handed me a beer, let's go to a party. I'm so in, <laughs> but I don't drink. I don't, I, I, I refuse to drink. I don't drink alcohol. I have it in a couple of years. Yeah. I, I stopped like, drinking too. Hey. I was like, Hey, you want a beer? I'm like, Nah, I'm all right. But if you throw some party into it, or if you're like, yeah, let's do a beer, dude. And then, and then let's get crazy. Let's get, let's go hard. Like, let's do this. Like it's the fun that is this, because people think that you cannot have fun without being intoxicated. 
Yeah, I, ask any twenty-two-year-old. It, ask. It's him. just ask such him. a it's such a lower vibrational uh, experience, though. In in my mind, like when I it is when I it whenever is. I drink, I start to feel dumber and sloppier. Tired. Yep. And and yep. so I do a lot to any, try to avoid that. Anything that's chemically made, like heroin or cocaine, it comes from a plant. Why you got to make it into a powder? Why don't you just smoke the plant? Like I don't know. Like why don't you smoke cocaine leaves? Like I don't know, <laughs> right? But anything that's like chemically made, because I mean, no one's making shrooms out of baking yeah. soda and 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 Drano, like like methamphetamine, for instance, <laughs> like meth, <laughs> yeah. right? Like people are stupid on meth. I mean, you're you're oh, literally man. stupid. I don't I don't know why anyone you know? does meth because I don't know a single person that's like, yeah, back in 2006, I was doing meth every day, and boy, was I productive. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, I built a billion dollar business because that meth really kept me focused and opened my mind. <laughs> Said nobody ever, right? Right. So, like marijuana, the ayahuasca, LSD, the shrooms, like all that stuff. You know, there's actually with DD with DTP, there's an actual animal that has 10 times more of that stuff than we do in our brain. Cause our brain already has right. it. We manufacture it's like it. that movie. It's like that movie, Lucy. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah. Okay. That's DD. That's D D DMT. Yeah. Or DMT. I'm yeah. sorry. DMT. I always say that DMT. Yeah. That's the, that's literally the same thing. Yeah. No, I, 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 I totally get that man. And, and uh, I, I love, I love where you're, you're coming from with that. So what, let me ask you this. What, what would you say to somebody who is, unbelievably depressed, uh, crippling, like crippling depression. They're at the point where you were gun in the mouth. They, they, they don't yep. know what to do next. What would yep. you say to that person? What's the first thing that they should do to get help? Cause so, like I, 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 uh, you know, I, I that's two questions in one. Yeah. <laughs> that's two questions in one. What should they do to get help? That's two questions in one. Right, break it down. So what should they do every day if they are depressed? They're going to commit suicide, whatever that like, that's one question. Gratitude. You can literally scientifically not be depressed and happy at the same time. You can't do it. Your body won't let you. You cannot do it. You cannot be depressed. You cannot be anxious and you cannot be happy and feel loved at the same time. So love always drives out hate period. So gratitude every single day. Gratitude has been scientifically linked to lowering your anxiety, your stress, and your depression. Most people feel anxiety because something is going to trigger them. They're going into a situation like, okay, I don't like this. I don't like this. Oh my gosh. Like I can't, I don't like being in large crowds. Like I was in New York city and it was, it was a lot for me. It just, I don't know. It just was. Now I'm a speaker. I speak at a lot of events that have like a thousand people at them. I'm good to go because I feel like I'm in charge. But if I walk into New York times or um, yeah, times square, if I walk into times square, I'm like, I'm like, oh, I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this because I don't have any control, right? So it just, it brings back a lot of stuff for me. And you have to count blessings every single day, three times a day, count blessings, whether you do it on Facebook or you call somebody and literally tell them that you're thankful for them or you have a gratitude journal. But when you use gratitude every single day, it's the number one way to lower your anxiety, stress, and depression immediately. And when you have a gratitude habit, you prolong your, your depression, anxiety, and stress. It's called the broaden and build theory. Every positive moment in life builds on the next positive, positive moment. Every negative moment takes you down further into a negative spiral. You ever had a really bad day and you're like, what else is going to happen? But, oh, look, another thing, another thing, another thing, right? Because we're focused on the negatives. And what we focus on expands. So what we focus on in our minds expands out into the universe. So focus on the positives and you'll see a bunch of positives. If you focus on the negatives, then you'll see a bunch of negatives. Gratitude. And is this what inspired the affirmation clothing line that you've launched then? It is. is. So helping to get gratitude daily in your in daily practice. I love that. It is. So, yep. so you said this was two questions. Uh, the other question, how would you answer that? If they, if they need to get help, which is most important, if they need to get help, there's a lot of services out there. There's a lot of services. If you're in the military, you can actually, if you're active duty or guard or reserve, you can call military one source and you can talk to somebody and they will refer you to six sessions with a therapist for free for military. Most people don't even know that exists. It's called military one source. That's amazing. 
And, they don't even know it exists. And and I, I you know, seriously, uh, getting getting a therapist. There's a lot of people who are like, oh, that that shows that I'm weak and I don't need that. It's like that's bullshit. Because I, I I went to yeah. therapy for 20 years and it, and it saved my life. It saved my life. Uh, and if it, like there's no, like if you're a president, you have advisors. Some of the if some presidents don't have good advisors and some presidents aren't good. I'm not mentioning any names, but uh, uh, but the point is, is that that, it, it, you know, if you if you have a problem like with your car, you go to a mechanic, you go to a specialist. Um, if there is something that you need to have done with your mind, you need to go to a specialist. And so getting getting help, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Nothing wrong with it. In fact, that that's the thing that takes straight. Well said. So, so, okay. <laughs> so what, how, how does success core fall into all of this? Like how, how did that, cause we, we've got to wrap up here in a, in a few minutes, but give us the rundown of how success core came out of all of this. And, and, and also what these boot, what these boot camps look like that you're running and like how many people, like who, who's the audience, like all that. For sure. For sure. So I became a drill instructor from 09 to 13. And this is where I figured out about speaking. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is absolutely incredible. I must do this the whole time. So I learned everything I could about speaking, training, coaching, mentoring, like the whole bit. And then in 2014, after my drill instructor duty was up, I found out about uh, the resilience program that the Air Force is building. So then I helped build the resilience program at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. And what's the resilience program? The resilience program on the Air Force Base is what they called CAF, which is Comprehensive Airman Fitness. Everybody in the Air Force is an airman. And it's Comprehensive Airman Fitness. Comprehensive Airman Fitness is where you have four pillars, mental, uh, mental physical, uh, social, and spiritual. And those four pillars are what guides each airman. And you must give of yourself and plant seeds and fill your cup and all that stuff in those four areas. You have to be mentally fit, physically fit, socially fit, and spiritually fit. Now, spirituality doesn't mean religion. Religion is the act of your spirituality. Spirituality just means that it, like your undying beliefs. A lot of people get it confused. Like, oh, I'm not a spiritual person. I'm not. Everybody's spiritual. You believe in something. So they built this program. They got it from UPenn. Uh, we went down to UPenn, went through their resilience program, came black or came came back and took that took that um program and militarized it they they basically militarized the resilience program from UPenn and so now it's black and white done deal um this is our resilience program this is what we this is what we believe in and you know all that so i ran that program from 2015 to uh 2019 and then I gave it to somebody else because you know, I'm got a year and a half left and I kind of want to do other stuff. But I built that program and ran that for about four years. And that sparked the, the, the success core because I was already doing some trainings. And so now I host four boot camps a year and they're in different places. Somebody will hire me. Um, if I don't get hired for like every quarter, I try to do one. So whether it's in North Carolina where I'm at or somewhere else, I just held one in High Point, North Carolina. We did a we did a boot camp, and we basically go through the mental, the spiritual, and the social emotional. And I teach a bit of emotional intelligence inside of that boot camp. And the boot camp is a half day workshop. There's leadership in there. There's a little bit of like business kind of entrepreneur practices because some of the people that come to me are business people who want to get their people more resilient. But the focus on it is how do you get somebody to withstand, recover, and grow? And PTSG is about your post-traumatic growth. Because you have this moment in time, how do you grow from it? How do you grow? Is your audience then a mixed bag? I mean, are you getting some business people? You're getting some people who just want to grow personally? Yeah, how, how do you market it? I don't. You don't market it? Nope. Is it, is it just strip, strictly word of mouth? It's basically word of mouth. It's basically me being on podcasts like, oh, I want to have one of those. I want to do one of those. And uh, and it's just I, I, I'm i calling people again, hustling, you know, like I'm not marketing anything. Right. But I'm, but I'm like, I'll call USO like, hey, USO. So in North Carolina, the USO has something called Warrior Reset. That's one of the boot camps. Military people come for a week to either Jacksonville or Fayetteville. 
and uh, you can bring your families and stuff. And I was doing a training one time and a guy was like, I feel like I was going to kill myself today, but I don't think I'm going to. We're like, holy sh crap. You know, like this is crazy. And then I just did one in High Point, North Carolina, like a couple of weeks ago. And a guy come up to me and he goes, how do you get out of depression? And, and his face is like, like this dude looks like he's hurting from something. And I, you know, I had a talk with them and everything. And, uh, and I told the people that were there, I said, you need to watch him. Something's going on with him. He's like, yeah, he's come to me lately with a lot of depression. I was like, there's something going on. And I think it has something to do with, with his belief in himself. And then come to find out that he was going through a divorce, didn't tell anybody. He's going through all this stuff. He's battling, didn't tell nobody. So he's holding it all in, you know? And so I could just tell just by talking to somebody, um, really what they're going through. And, uh, and, and it's just not good. You know, you hold it all in and it's just, it's, it, it's not good. And so those boot camps go through positive psychology research studies used for you to grow through every moment in life. You know, I teach classes like gratitude. I have a goal setting class, which is like nothing you've ever seen before. We literally vision board your goals out. And you see them. And then we create a plan for you. It's not, here's how you make smart goals. I hate <laughs> smart goals. I can't stand it. Specific and measurable? Cool, got it. But what's the measuring? How do you measure a goal? Is it five feet wide? Is it three years long? How do you measure it? Realistic. Who's realism? Mine or yours? If I say I'm going to the moon, I'm going to the moon. I don't care what you think. I'm going to the moon. Now, whether it happens or not, it's not up to you. It's up to me and, you know, whatever. But I always tell people if your goals aren't large enough and they don't throat punch somebody, they're not big enough. Let me let me ask you this, because a lot of your marketing strategy seems to be kind of in the area of personal branding in that you're doing a lot of speaking. You're going on podcasts. You have your own podcast. You're doing you TEDx. Wrote you wrote a book. You're doing TEDx talks. Like, um, yep. so is that kind of your your main like philosophy then is I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to get on stages. I'm going to build authority and, uh, and prestige by positioning. Because you mentioned positioning in the beginning of this, of the show. Um, is that kind of, is yes. that kind of your philosophy here with marketing? And then what was your TEDx talk on too? I want to hear that. Also. Yes. My TEDx talk was called, uh, hack your brain for success. It's TEDx Wilmington. Cool. I like that title by the way. <laughs> so oh, yeah, you. tell me, tell me a little bit about like your personal branding philosophies though, or, or how you see like the best ways to get, uh, if somebody's listening to this and they want to get themselves out there and they want to get seen in sure. grow visibility, what, what are your philosophies there? So now we're getting into my favorite subject. Good. Now we're getting into some stuff and we got like five so, minutes. So let's go. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, we'll figure it out. Right. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have my own radio show. That's do I like to be done. Actually, I could probably go about five or 10 minutes. Cool. Anyway. All right. So here's what, here's my personal belief on branding, whatever, whatever, all that stuff. Right. So marketing and you can, I love that Google and like the dictionary, like everybody has like their own definition. So fine. I'll play along. Here's mine. Marketing is your emotional response to the words on a page. That's it. That's marketing. Marketing is your, is, is the marketer is soliciting a certain emotional response from the reader to do and act a certain way or to do a certain thing. That's it. That's marketing. If you think about it like that, what can I say or do to make Justin do something? If I want to sell Justin something, what do I got to do and say? What does he care about? What, because the way that he thinks, feels, and believes is much differently than somebody else who thinks, feels, and believes. So thoughts, feelings, and beliefs drive all reactions and all decisions 100% of the time. Your thoughts, your feelings, your beliefs on Trump, abortion, politics, cars, the Super Bowl halftime show, everything, everything. Thoughts, feelings, and beliefs drive all reactions and all decisions. So you as a marketer need to find out what drives people's thoughts, beliefs, and feelings. So you need to know your audience too then. A hundred percent. Yeah. You must know what they think, feel, and believe hundred percent of the time. So with, with branding, everybody thinks that branding is the color of your logo. It's not. Branding is your personal core values that you personally believe in. Your company's branding is you as the CEO or whoever driving that company culture 
through the values and standards that you have set for your company. That's that to me is branding. Now, if you looked at guys like David Breer, David Breer is an amazing, he should be on your show, by the way, an amazing guy talks about branding and he is super smart and probably the number one, number one branders on the planet outside of like Gary Vaynerchuk and all the other people that people know. Yeah. But David Breer is absolutely amazing. Uh, there's another guy, Christopher Lockhead, who you've had on your show, who is a very good friend of mine. Oh, Christopher yeah. Lockhead's a good friend of mine. And, and him and I talk all the time, all the time. And, and branding is the way that people are seeing your company. I talk about positioning. Hardly anybody is talking about positioning. Trout and, uh, uh, and the other guy, I can't remember his name, wrote a book called Positioning. That's what that's supposed, that's what the book's called. Positioning. It has a subtitle about uh, something about your mind or whatever. I've never read it, but I heard it's pretty good. But those guys, I know the basis of it is basically, you know, it, is how you position yourself in the marketplace. I talk a lot about. There's nobody talking about positioning like I'm talking about it. Positioning is the way that the marketplace perceives and receives you and your offers and your program, products, and services. If they think it is shit, it is shit. <laughs> If they think that you are not a subject matter expert, they do, they will never do business with you. Yeah. So 100, okay. 90% of businesses will fail in the first year because of what reason? Capital maybe because infrastructure, because none of that, they're not positioned. If a VC is going to give somebody money, they better be positioned to receive it. They better have a position in the marketplace. Otherwise you're not getting the money. You're not going to have infrastructure set up. Therefore you're not positioned to take over. You don't have a hiring and firing system in your business to hire and fire anybody. Therefore, you are not positioned to take over any kind of market category at all. Positioning is everything, which is my next book that's going to come out here in a couple months. Positioning is everything. Even in sex. And, and I like the point that you made about perception because a lot of this is perceptual. Um, and and I, yeah. I've talked about like how if you speak on a stage, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're like the foremost expert on a certain subject, but the perception in the room is going to be that you are the yep. foremost expert because you're the one in charge. You're the one on stage. So I think, uh, I think that perceptual piece is also major. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot of speakers that are full of crap, whatever they say on stage, but the fact that you're on that stage automatically gives you an authoritarian outlook. As a matter of fact, author authority, authoritarian, all stems from author. So people write a book and you'll see, okay, anybody listening to the show who is promoting, promoting, you must write a book so that you become the authority. Stop it. You suck. Don't do that. <laughs> That's not fair. Just because you write a book doesn't mean crap. You can write the worst book in America and, 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 and promote it like it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. You can't put sprinkles on crap and call it something else. It's still crap. It's just crap with sprinkles now. So stop it. You know how many people I see, like, I wrote a book and I'm going to be an authority. Like, authority on what? Like, what are your qualifications? Authority goes way deeper than just because you wrote about something. Yeah. Like, what experience do you have? Like, what qualifications do you have? I built four businesses while serving on active duty. My experience in building businesses, I built four of them. Do you know how many 22-year-old life coaches I know that are, like, from California that are from Southern California who from like San Diego, from like the rich part of San Diego and mommy and daddy paid for their college. I know them too. <laughs> yeah. Do you know how many 22 year old get, I will punch you in the throat. Do you know how many people I know that are 22 years old selling their life program? My first question is what's the hardest moment of your life? Yeah. What Lamborghini you have to buy, what color your car is the hell out of my face. <laughs> Did you put a gun in your mouth? No, no, get the fuck out of my face. Sorry to swear on your show, but I'm just saying. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said for life experience. And a lot of my most important life experience moments happened in my mid to late 20s, early yep. 30s. Oh, yeah. Yep. I literally, this kid comes to me, he's 23 years old. He's like, man, I really want to build a business. Oh, man, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be the, the most amazing coach ever or whatever. I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm thinking like marketing, websites, whatever. Um, you know, so he's like, yeah, I'm going to do this, 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 but I hear you're like great at marketing and positioning. And like, I really want to be like the best. I'm like, cool. What category are you going to create? What's a category? I'm like, oh my God. Okay. So after our talk of like building a new market category for himself, uh, he says, yeah, I just want to be a coach. I'm like, well, what kind of coach? Why well, just want to be a life coach? What kind of life coach? 
I don't know. I just want to tell people like how to live a great life. I'm like, wow, that sounds like a real great title of a book. <laughs> You know, like life, I coach life. What, like, <laughs> like what kind of what kind of great life? Like what's that look like? like you want to teach millionaires? Do you want to teach billionaires? Do you want? To, he's like, well, I just want to teach people like how to be happy. I'm like, there's a million people who teach people how to be happy. What is your hook? I'm like, what's the hardest thing you've ever been through? He's like, well, I mean, I don't know. Like, I just got out of my mom's house, and like, yeah, he's like, I just got out of my mom's house. Like, I just got my own place, and I'm just trying to do something with my life. I'm like, dude, you have no experience at all zero what do you love i love video games then teach fucking video games don't teach life like you have no experience are you gonna teach marriage you know how many people that i know that teach marriage never been married in their life yeah like this is out of control the coaching is out of control teach what you know that is how you become positioned i'm i'm positioned because i built four businesses well i, I can just tell you that I had, I had opinions on like being a father before I became a father and uh, the experience of actually having a child very much changed me <laughs> in that regard. Oh, right? So it's like, it's like, wow. Okay. I, that that's like the greatest, like humbling thing for me is to be like, okay, yes. If you don't, if you don't have experience in what you're teaching, then uh, you really can't teach it because even if you're regurgitating other people's materials, it's, it's yep. a whole different ball game when you're actually experiencing what happens, you know, like for my example, as a father, <laughs> you, you, you got to get the 10,000 hours of, of mastery. Yeah, I get that. I get that whole thing. Like I, I got way more than 10,000. I had 10,000 hours of speaking in the first four years when I was, um, when I was a drill instructor. I mean, I taught, in eight weeks, we taught uh, 90 some odd classes and each of them were about an hour to three hours long. So literally in the first year, I already had like two or three hours or two or 3,000 um, hours just in the first like year, year and a half of me being a drill instructor. I already had like two to 3,000 hours of classroom instruction of like teaching and training and like all that. Um, totally get that. 10,000 hours. That's a great, great number. Uh, people hate me. Because I, I, I don't know. I don't fluff. Like I just don't, I'm brutally honest. Only when I'm only when I'm provoked or asked. So the guy's like, man, I really want to get your feedback on my Facebook live, man. I really want to like teach you stuff. I'm like, cool, man, teach me your stuff. He taught the e-myth and then had the audacity to call himself a highly sought after speaker. I'm like, dude, you ripped off somebody's work. You loser. <laughs> like you can't sit there and like rip somebody's stuff off and then call it your own. Hello, Jay Shetty. Like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> did he give the pie story and everything <laughs> the baker or the <laughs> dude, he drew it on a whiteboard, which made it even worse. Yeah. Like, you like, that's so bad. Like wh when I'm coaching people, we literally start from scratch. I'm like, what do you know? What do you know? And if they don't know anything, I'm like, what do you love? I would much rather fail at something I love than succeed at something I don't love. And that goes right back into positioning. You must position yourself in a way that allows your business to thrive because when you improve your positioning in the marketplace, people receive you and perceive you a lot differently and they're more willing to help you when you need the help. I get tagged on social media posts for podcasts, creating and launching and monetizing a podcast and creating and launching and monetizing your business or your speaker business. Someone's like, oh, how do I get booked to speak? Boom, like 15 people tag me. That's how you know you're positioned. Everybody right now, Justin, you or Rose, do this, do this, okay? Find 50 people, write their names down. And this is an exercise for everybody listening. Find 50 people, call them, text them, Facebook message them, ask the question, what do I do? What is it that I do? And what do I do well? No, no, uh -uh. not even that. It's what just what, how they see you, how they view what you. Okay. Do I do? No, don't ask them that. How do you view me? No, because now they're getting emotional. Okay. What do I do? Maybe, maybe everybody knows, knows you guys as the podcast guys for marketing. Now, now, you know, Justin and I met and like, I, I know more than, than, you know, um, than people probably listening or like, I know what you guys do. Right. So, so when you ask me, like, what do you do? Like, well, I already know that because we've had conversations like, you know, at New Media Summit and other places like we've like, online. I know. But just ask people, what do I do? Or what is it that you think I do? Like, what do I do? Or like, what do you think it is that I do? And it's probably somebody will say podcast. Like, and what else? Like, what else do I do? And let's say they go, oh, you teach people marriage. You're like, what the fuck? <laughs> what? Like, what are you talking about? I, I swear, I promise you, somebody will say something like, oh, well, you teach people um, apps. 
Yeah. Like what? What the hell? And you write down the 50 people's responses. Guess what? Add that up. If 40 people tell you that you're the podcast guru, guess what you now are? You're a podcast guru. Yeah. If, if five people tell you that, that you guys are the app guys and you guys are super smart and, and whatever, then maybe that's a second business you guys need to open. Either you position yourself in the marketplace or the marketplace will automatically position you. And once you're automatically positioned in the marketplace, it's much more difficult to realign people's thoughts, feelings, and beliefs than to just say, screw it. That's what I do. Because they already think that you do that. Now just build a business around it. Then you're dealing with like a whole reinvention idea if you're if you're trying to change once you're already once you're already out there. Um yes, I 100%. agree with you. And and early on in my business, I think I struggled with this worse than now. But I mean, yeah, the, the, I'd go to have conversations with people and they're like, I have no idea what you do. <laughs> and that was, uh, yep. and that was, I think, a lack of communication. And there was no, there was no marketing. clear, yeah, I mean, I, I could say marketing, but I mean, like, inside of that, it would be, they just would have no clue beyond that. So that's, uh, that's something yep. I've, I've worked on. And you know, we talk, you know, we talk about podcasting authority and things like that. Yep. Yeah. But but I like the idea of 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 getting other people to reflect back to you mm -hmm. what you do so it's concise and meaningful. Uh, I mean, up until now, when I ask people, they just say, "Well, you're Captain Docky Peters." <laughs> that, that's well, what it's as yes. as Gary Vaynerchuk would say. To give him credit, uh, you know, you need that level of self awareness to know like yeah, how you're being perceived and and to have that. And a lot of people, I think, don't have that. So, you know how many people could build a million dollar business based on what they think the marketplace? based on what the marketplace thinks that they do. I'm not, I'm not even joking. Yeah. I, I am so dead serious about it. I'm going to put, I'm, this is in my book. Okay. How many people in the marketplace think that you're a certain therapist or a certain speaker or you're a certain whatever, right? But you're not even, you're not even marketing yourself as that, but that's what they think you do. Guess what you need to do? Capitalize on that. That's what the marketplace thinks that you do. Now build a business around it. Most people are like, what business do I want to create? <laughs> oh, this is such a, what business? Uh, ask your marketplace what the hell they think you do. Like, what is it that you think I do? And sometimes I'll go, I don't know. Well then build a business around what people already think that you do. It's already, number one, you already got people that think that you do that. So Create, create content, create progress, products, and services, create, you guys know who Joe Polish is? Yes, I do. Joe Polish is awesome. I love his, I love marketing podcast. I listen to three marketing podcasts. I listen to Christopher Lockhead. I listen to you guys. And I listen to Joe Polish. It's the only three marketing podcasts I ever what? listened to. That's, that's it. That's it. And I said that to Justin before. I was like, you're the only podcast. Like I listen to you guys. Oh so, man. I'm touched. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so I listen, I listen to Lockhead on marketing and, and follow your different. Cause I mean, he's an awesome friend. He's an awesome dude. I listen to you guys. Yeah. And he loves his chicken. So he loves his yeah, chicken. Yep. And then I listen to Joe Polish and I had Joe Polish on my show and we talked about positioning versus marketing versus branding. We talked about this in depth and, and he's all about like, number one, you create a free awareness guide about whatever it is, how to start a podcast, how to, his carpet cleaning awareness guide, consumer awareness guide on the top five things that you need to know before you hire a carpet cleaner, do that for your business. If you don't know what business to create, ask your people, what is it that I do? Or what do you think that it is that I do? And if they tell you like the top 10 things, then you need to build a speaker or you need to build a business. And if it's speaking, if it's podcast, if it's whatever, then build a business around that, but create a consumer awareness guide for your people for free, build your email list, sell to your email list, and then boom, get them into an online course and then get them to, into an upsell and then get them into a live event and then get them into a $10,000 program. And then Dude, that's the whole evolution of nurturing your client. Everybody says, I got to have clients and I got to find those clients and I got to find that. Most people can't even tell me what their client acquisition cost is. Most people are like, how much does it cost for you to onboard a client? Uh, well, I took out a $40 Facebook ad the other day. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. What does it cost you mon monetarily for you to onboard a new client? What does it cost? Most people don't know. But everybody knows what it takes to nurture them, though. So it's it's more cost effective to nurture your already existing client because they know, like, and trust you. And if you create a referral program, then the other know, like, and trust people connect with other people that they know, like, and trust. And then referrals, 37% of my business is based on referrals. Yeah. So 
Oh my god, I could talk about this for hours. But anyway. yeah, this is this is really, really, really good stuff. And you basically summarize the building blocks of a million dollar business in like a minute and a half, right there. Correct. Which uh, <laughs> Correct. I love it. That's a it's it's a perfect soundbite. Yeah, man. Well, we we got to wrap up the show, man. And I I I, I, I we would love to have you back on though. So That'd be awesome. Uh, please please come back on. Uh, and uh, you know, before we go though, got to find out uh because we are the marketing geeks what are you most geeky about just in general tv show book movie hobby anything what are you what are you most geeky about what's geeking you out right now i geek out on systems and strategies i have a system and strategy for everything yeah is is that is that the thing that you're like you 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 like like what's your what's the system that's geeking you out the most right now what i just laid out okay like like laying that. out income streams or laying out your 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 LTV. I love it. I love it. Well, I, lifetime lifetime value for listeners out there. Yep. No, wait, but, yep. but real quick, real quick though, what what are you geeky about? Like in the in the off uh, outside of business, like uh, do you do you watch? Do you have time to watch Netflix? Do you have time to watch movies? Oh, get the that shit don't pay me. That doesn't pay me. Yeah. That doesn't pay me. Well, what, what what do you like to do? Do you consume? Do you like to read books? Like what do you what do you like to do? You know, you know, honestly, I didn't read any books in 2019 and I created, I created six figures. I didn't read one book. Yeah. And people are like, oh my God, I gotta read books. Like how can you not read a book? And dude, read Google, read Forbes, read Inc, read, you know, all that stuff. Like, come on. Anyway. So what I'm geeky about is number one, my family, when I'm not building businesses and podcasting and like all that stuff, I'm with my family. My girls are in gymnastics. I love it. Um, I don't always get to go see them. Um, I got to see him like last week. It was awesome. She was doing how, how really, really well. Uh, five and 13. Very well. Oh, 13. Wow. Okay. Yep. Five and 13. I have a, I have a one and a half year old. That's it. Yeah. So they're <laughs> in gymnastics, but there are shows that I will never miss. And one of them is uh, Paw Patrol Blue Bloods. Yeah. Right. I watch, dude, I love baby boss. I'm not even joking. <laughs> I love watching baby boss. <laughs> Dude, baby it's boss really is pretty it's, good. If you're an entrepreneur, like you have to watch that show. Watch yeah. Baby Boss. I'm not even joking. It gives you like there's negotiating tactics. I, just watch it. It's freaking awesome. But I never miss Blue Bloods or Chicago PD. I just I love those two shows. And then my newest fix is The Mass Singer. Love The Mass Singer. <laughs> <laughs> love awesome. The Mass Singer. So uh that's great. Uh Justin, what are you geeky about right now? Um I I watched the uh, the Aaron Hernandez special on Netflix. I got to to learn the story behind that guy. Oh, that was <laughs> Talk about a psychological profile. It's a weird weird story, but it's a good show. It's only three episodes. Uh, it's a it's it's a true crime. Um, crazy like how effed up that guy was. And then uh, I just we just I just finished You season two on Netflix, which is uh, about a well like a it's like a dexter have you ever seen the show dexter it's like that a new good. version of it so it's pretty good uh kind of like a stalker serial killer guy that is in a relationship and uh it, it's a good show uh i enjoyed it but that's those are my two those are my two when i have time and i uh i binge watched some of that over the weekend which uh, i hadn't been able to do that in quite a while so it was nice I, oh, you want to know something awesome you want to something awesome that? i'm not even joking yeah. i i yeah. I'm, I'm not promise just watch this it's called Never Say Never. What, what is it? And it's a documentary. It's a documentary. Justin Bieber. Oh, okay. I'm not even okay. joking. It's from 2011. The kid was like 15, 16 years old. And I was literally at the end of the show rooting for baby Bieber. Like, I'm not even kidding. Like, the kid, like, if you look at the hustle that that kid, this kid, Justin Bieber, at freaking 13 years old, was not getting any radio play. So he, physically walked into radio stations with his guitar and asked to play on the radio because they weren't playing his songs. That's awesome. He went radio station to radio station to radio station physically and just walked up in there and was like, I want to play my songs. And they're like, sure, what do you got? That's how he got famous. And I never would have known like, that. So that's cool. Dude, it is an amazing show. I don't even like Justin Bieber, but I was <laughs> like, yo, 16-year-old Justin Bieber sold out hey. Madison Square Garden, rock star. Like, I was pumped after, like, I felt, amazing after watching never say never on netflix justin bieber did you gotta watch i think it's on netflix well, i, I will gotta watch i will it. check i will check that out I, i'm a fan of people that know their goals and pursue them at whatever means yes. necessary yeah dude i was popped uh, after watching that i uh i will definitely check it out i just finished reading uh the testaments which is the sequel to the handmaid's tale <laughs> very cool i yeah i was way into that book uh 
And uh, I, I highly recommend it if you're a fan of The Handmaid's Tale. If not, watch the show, uh, and uh, you the show is fantastic. So that's what I'm geeky about. Uh, man, this was this was a fantastic conversation, uh, Sean. And I again, I cannot thank you enough for being on the show. I know you you actually went over your time uh, with us, but uh, uh, please come back and and enlighten us more with uh, your wisdom, Sean Douglas. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know what would be super awesome? What's that? You know what would be super awesome? We should do a strategy show. Yeah. Oh, yes. Totally. Dude, we, do that? We, should, we should literally just randomly pick businesses and go, what do you see for their marketing? Or what would you do here? And what, how would you expand that out? And like literally create blueprints for just a bunch of random businesses. <laughs> I you, love that idea. You, can, you know what you can do? I'm so forward thinking. This is what I love. This is, I'm geeking out. I got goosebumps right now. Here's what you should do. Ask your audience for five. Five people submit a business plan, submit something, and we will create a blueprint on an episode for those five businesses. And oh, then, man. Because you get your you get your audience involved in your show more for that and do a giveaway. You get five, you know, the, the 10 best get something, the five that we pick get something, the number one best one get something else or whatever, right? So you've rewarded 10 people for playing in this little game or whatever, and then you bring your audience into your show more. You well, go. you heard I, it here I first. It. So for anyone that wants to take us up on this, uh, email us info at marketinggeekspodcast.com. Boom. Yes. Yes. I'm all, I, I'm so into this idea, man. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get Iris uh, to contact you. And then as soon as you're out of the military, uh, let's go to Burning Man. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to take you to Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, we'll party, buddy. All right, yeah. man. Uh, uh, Sean Douglas, everybody, thank you so much once again. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for being on the marketing gigs. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, wow, what a what that the, I'm I'm inspired, man. Uh, you know, every once in a while we do a show where uh, I actually go back and listen to it again because i pick up things that yeah uh i think i think we we hit on something there like toward like what about halfway through the episode we got into his like interest zone and then bam he came alive and came up with some great great ideas oh man man i'm 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 (laughs) I'm so inspired but uh uh and uh and before we go though I, i i definitely need to give some shout outs to uh a couple of our seven listeners uh, yes. uh, so we've got, uh, Jamel Nichols. I'm, I'm hoping I'm saying her name, right? Uh, <laughs> Jamel Nichols is, uh, uh, she so sweet. She reached out, said, uh, that, uh, marketing geeks has transformed her commute. Thanks for entertaining me, uh, with informative content. Thank you, Jamel, for being one of our, uh, seven listeners. I don't know. I mean, if you were here in the Netherlands, you would be Yomel. So I, 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 I'm, I, I, and she reached out, she reached out to me as well on LinkedIn and I was like super late to respond to her, but, um, thank you. Thank you for listening to the show and for supporting us. And we love hearing back from listeners like you. And I also want to do a shout out to, uh, uh, Yif- oh man, here we go again. Y- <laughs> uh, y- Yifat Cohen, uh, Yifat Cohen is, uh, uh, reached out also said uh she's been uh listening to the show and she just loves it uh so she connected with me uh on linkedin thank you uh, i mean i it, it warms my heart that that people actually uh listen to the show and they think it's listenable so yes um, no I, I know i know if uh if I, so we we just uh had a couple conversations together and she is a live stream influencer and kind of like uh she was like the go-to person for google plus back when google plus was a thing so oh. she's pretty pretty deep into marketing too so. oh wow wow maybe we should have her on the show yeah absolutely yeah yeah so uh awesome people keep listening you have any questions for us uh, and I think, I think we're, I, I want to do this thing that he was mentioning. I think it's good. That would, that would be, that'd be, <laughs> I love it. I love it. He'd come up with ideas for us. I love it. Yeah. Uh, but it, no, it's a really good one. And, and absolutely. If, if, if anyone's interested in this, please, uh, send us an email info at marketing geeks, podcast.com. Let us know, like if you have, if you want to participate in this, like what your industry is, um, some basics about your business. And, uh, we, will absolutely take on this challenge. I, I don't know what the timetable is going to look like, but we, we want to do this. Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's, it'll probably be after like March or April because 
uh, we're putting together a big project that we're going to announce soon-ish, right? That's right. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's going to change everything. Everything. It, and you can just see this summer, everything will be different. And with that, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, another fine episode of the Marketing Geeks. Comes this to one was so good. It was so good that we got our guest to stay on like 10 minutes extra because it was so good. That's right. That's right. I, uh, I, I love doing this show, man. I'm, uh, yeah. it's the thing, you know what? It's the thing that keeps me, keeps me, I, I, I'm going to express my gratitude to you and uh, to all of our seven listeners. Uh, during, during my week, it is the thing that I, I really have a lot of joy with. So thank you everybody for listening. Likewise, this is, this is one of my highlights of the week. I, I really enjoy recording with you and having these like crazy conversations. And I like, I like letting them go where they go. A lot of fun, and plus we learn. We learn from this show as we as we narrate, as we teach, whatever you want to call this. What do we call this? I don't know. We preach. We preach. That's what it is. <laughs> and please connect with us on LinkedIn or Iris. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are the Marketing Geeks. And we are almost out. But... Stay classy.